everybody, hope you're having a great day. My name is Jay and you're watching Clouded Reactions. So I actually called off of my second job today because I'm kind of tired and we had just watched Poltava, Poltava and then I took a nap, I took an hour nap, woke up and it got dark really quick. I thought it was going to be an hour. I wanted to take an hour nap. It's actually been three hours. It is now, it's 6.49, about to be 7 o'clock so the sun's starting to go down. But we're going to react to the history behind Poltava and see what's going on. See how how um, Carola Swex got wounded before the battle even started, because I don't know what's going on there. And to figure out where this mysterious extra ten thousand uh, um, Carolians showed up from, because I thought there was only ten thousand of them. All of a sudden, there's twenty thousand. I don't know. So let's just hop right on in. Slaget vid Poltava var helt klart avgörande för slutet på svenska stormarfin. Och Sabaton skrev en låt om det. I haven't seen Par in a while. The Great Northern War was undecided for several years. Tsar Peter I had envisioned that the future of his coming Russian Empire would rely on a presence in the Baltics and access to the seas. So back in 1700, he had forged an alliance with Saxony and Denmark-Norway to challenge the mighty Swedish Empire and had established St. Petersburg, named after himself, in 1703, on the site of a captured Swedish fortress as his window to Europe. And although Peter's forces had been trounced by the Swedes at the Battle of Narva, Swedish King Charles XII had hesitated to follow up on his success and throw the Russians out of the Baltics. It was not until 1707 and 1708, after he had spent an awful lot of time meddling with Polish-Lithuanian politics, that Charles swung his focus back against the Russian threat to his empire. The perfect moment had long passed, but the Swedish war machine was still mighty, especially with the military genius was Charles XII at its head. He did not choose the strategically safer route by advancing on St. Petersburg, but rather would direct his small but professional army to strike directly at the heart of Russia. By capturing Moscow, Charles hoped to end the war in one fell swoop and achieve something that people would remember for centuries to come. Although such a daring plan should have required months of planning and preparation, Charles, never known for his patience, immediately broke camp and made for Minsk and then the Dnieper River. Naturally, Tsar Peter watched Charles every move. Peter had a Russian contingent of more than 70,000 men at hand, technically enough to challenge Charles's 40,000 strong host. But Peter knew all too well after Narva, relying on numbers alone, folly against the veteran Swedish soldiers. So, shadowing the Blue Army, Peter ordered his troops to engage in a scorched earth policy. Every village in the path of the Swedish host was to be destroyed and fields to be burnt so the Swedes would find neither shelter nor food. Charles hoped to eventually bring the Russians to a decisive battle where he could crush them in the open, but Peter sure didn't want to risk a pitched battle. Instead, the Russian troops fortified the banks along the great rivers and contested every attempted river crossing. The quality of the Swedish troops and Charles' tactical skill overcame those smaller battles, but each engagement thinned his lines. Where the Tsar could easily replace 3,000 men, the Swedes were hurt by losing 1,000. July 1708, though, they finally reached the town of Mogilev on the Dnieper, and as the late summer wore on, they marched in long lines through the wilderness as supplies dwindled and exhaustion set in. Day and night, they were forced to remain on guard against Tartar and Bashkir horsemen who cut down any stragglers. The Swedish army grew wearier, they grew hungrier, but their unshaken belief in their king and his vision kept them on track. But even Charles could see that a crisis was developing, so he sent a message back to Riga to General Levenhaupt to bring in fresh supplies and some reinforcements. But when his officers began urging their king to pull back to the Dnieper and wait for the supplies to arrive, this brought the feeling of retreating to Charles' proud mind, and he just stopped listening. Instead, he opted for an alternative. Now, back in Mogilev, Charles had received a message from Ivan Stepanovich Mazepa, Hetman, chief 
of the Ukrainian Cossacks. Mazepa is truly an interesting historical character. He once served at the Polish court, but after being caught having an affair with the wife of a Polish nobleman, Mazepa was tarred and feathered and tied to a horse bound for the open steppe. There, he was taken in by the Cossacks, proud and fearsome tribes that ruled the borderlands between the great powers. Yo, we should um, encourage that same type of treatment towards people who cheat and destroy marriages. I mean, for both men and women. I don't know what happened to the woman in this scenario. But we should definitely do that. Tar them to a horse and just, <laughs> to, you know, let the horse carry them for wherever, however far, until the guy gets free somehow. <laughs> in the east, the exiled Mazepa impressed the Cossacks so much that he eventually rose to the rank of Hetman. Usually, the Cossacks fought in the service of the Tsars against the Turks. But Mazepa spoke for those that wanted independence and their own realm. For this... He had secretly negotiated with Charles and offered a force of 30,000 horsemen to fight against the Tsar. This tempting offer now made Charles turn south to meet Mazeppa, completely abandoning his reinforcements. Poor Levenhaupt soon found himself abandoned on the banks of the Dnieper with no trace of his king. Charles and Mazeppa met in Siberia, a rough, unruly country between Poland, Lithuania, and Russia in what is now Ukraine. However, Instead of the promised 30,000 horsemen, Mazeppa had only like 1,500 with him. Peter had found out about Mazeppa's double dealings, and a Russian army had just besieged and destroyed his capital. Mazeppa was ostracized and excommunicated and no longer held power among the Cossacks. Sturdy Levenhaupt eventually made it to Severia too, but with only a fraction of his men and had also been forced to ditch ammunition and artillery while fleeing from the Russians that had been hard on his heels. Now left with neither a large host of Cossacks nor a large host of Swedish reinforcements, Charles set up camp with around 24,000 men in the woods with winter around the corner. A winter that was one of the harshest on record. So he's got 24,000, but it said that he had 40,000 originally, didn't it? Didn't it say he had like 40,000? And why would he, man, that guy screwed him over. He was expecting 30,000 horsemen and only got 1,500. So he, instead of waiting for the reinforcements and the resupply, the, the, the supplies. Like, I can understand, okay, there's a bigger army, well, let's go link up with them. But, I mean, your men are hungry, man. You should have at least waited. For, if you don't want to wait for the reinforcements because you didn't need them, you should have at least waited for the food and for the, you know, all the stuff that goes with resupplying, you know, gunpowder and such. That... I don't know why he, I guess that it sounded too juicy, man. 30,000 horsemen? Shoot, it's like the winged hussars all over again. Except, you know, probably not the same, even remotely the same caliber. Whole parts of Europe froze. Frostbite in the Swedish camp was widespread, and many men froze to death in their sleep. His officers still hoped to convince their king to return to Poland. But Charles wanted to move on as soon as the thaws of spring had arrived. He had made the decision to march against the fortress of Poltava. The siege began in May 1709, but the Swedes, with little artillery and powder left, were clearly not strong enough to take the fortress head on. Charles exposed himself to danger time and time again, constantly urging his men onwards. And one day, as he was riding outside the fortress with Levenhaupt, the king was hit by a bullet. The projectile punched straight through his foot, crushing its bones. It was feared that he might even lose his foot, though he did not. Things went from bad to worse. The Tsar Peter arrived at the scene at the head of 90,000 men. With the king out of the fight, command was up to Marshal Renquo. Charles ordered him to order the attack in his stead. So with only 13,000 men available and only a handful of cannons left, the Swedes were to attack the strongly fortified... Wait a minute, real quick. They just said he had 24,000. Now they're saying he went down to 13,000? What? So I'm guessing... Well, I guess since, um... Uh... Carl the Twelve got shot in the foot. So I'm guessing they had some skirmishes, you know, here and there. But they lost 10,000 before they even tried to attack Poltava? And I wonder if they knew Peter the Great. I wonder if they knew or not. I wonder if they knew that Peter had 90,000 housed there. So you're putting that... What, 13, 14,000 that they said against 90,000? 
I don't see the logic. Unless he didn't know how many were in there, but still. That's not a huge force. 13,000? I mean, it's never good to uh, attack a, a city. At least if you're not... I mean, they're ill-equipped, too. They said that they have, like, the gunpowder and the... What did they say? The... Gun, what, what? I don't know if they had cannons or the light uh, artillery or something like that. Doesn't make no sense. Red Russian camp opposite them. Surprise attack seemed like the only option for success. But even if the king had personally been leading his troops, the long trail through Russia had left the Swedish army exhausted and undersupplied. They would have to pull off the impossible. On June 28th, shortly after midnight, the Swedish troops advanced towards the enemy's lines. The battlefield was like a long corridor. On its flanks, the Russians had fortified the woods, and Charles' plan was to quickly overrun the redoubts in between in a speedy surprise attack. If they managed to capture most of the artillery batteries early on, they could turn them against their enemy. Vanguard began slowly moving through the cover of darkness. They were spotted by a Russian patrol. A pistol shot echoing through the night awoke the Russian defenders and spoiled the surprise. Still, though, the attack went off well. The Swedes were formidable soldiers. A mad dash by the Swedish cavalry captured Russian field batteries in the center. Under the cover of their own cannons, the whole Swedish force advanced. Leibenhaupt's infantry pressed the center and overtook the first redoubts with relative ease as the Swedish cavalry on their left flank successfully attacked and routed the Russian cavalry. However, as the advance continued to exploit the breakthroughs, an order reached them to stop. Historians to this day do not really know who exactly gave the order to halt in the middle of a promising attack, but the king was soon brought in on a litter. Renhold seemed close to a nervous breakdown, and the king explained nothing. With the opportunity gone, the pause gave the Russians enough time to react and reorganize, and Peter could now clearly see how few the Swedes actually numbered. As the king finally ordered the attack to continue, the Russians counterattacked. In the end, it came down to 4,000 tired and exhausted Swedes to fight over 30,000 Russian troops and 100 cannons in entrenched positions head on, still true to their oath and their belief in the king. The blue boys went on the attack. It was a gallant, though tragic rush into certain death. 2,000 Swedes lay dead on the ground before the rest finally stormed into the Russian lines with swords and halberds. None returned. Charles himself lay bleeding on the ground as a cannonball had destroyed his litter and killed 21 out of his 24 orderlies. Loya Leibenhaupt rushed in to rescue his king. It was a narrow escape many officers paid for it with their lives, trying to bring the king to safety. Even tragic Leibenhaupt, rallying the last man standing to guard the rear, by some time for the flight, had to finally surrender to the Russians. Peter himself came to the imprisoned officers and asked, Say, where is my brother Charles? To Peter's disappointment, Charles had survived, and with a few hundred men at his side, had escaped south into Ottoman territory. His army, however, Arguably the best fighting force on earth at that time had vanished, swallowed up by the Russian countryside and defeated by their enemies. Is there like, um, because they said historians still don't know to this day why the battle was halted mid, mid attack. Are there any like theories as to why? You know, are there like any like, um, yeah, are there any theories as to why it was halted when it was kind of going in their favor somehow? I don't know how they were able to pull it off, but they did. Who? I'm thinking, uh, you know, I, it couldn't have been Corollis, right? I don't think he could have. He couldn't have been that like, I don't know, who would have halted a battle just so he can, um, because apparently he wasn't with them at the time, but he regrouped with them. So why would he, I don't know if he would stop it. Just so you can regroup with them and then continue the attack. Makes no sense, especially if it was in their favor. But dang, so that, that could have cost them. Maybe not, I don't know. But it could have at least, they could have at least gone farther. 
or killed more if they didn't like halt the attack. Mid, mid attack. Who, who, who does that? I would like to know. If you guys didn't know if there's any theories out there, I would love to know. Because apparently I'm not going to learn from it in this history video. It's interesting that this song is about the Swedish And also they said that he survived. And he, he was able to escape. But the whole Carolian army never made it back. So I wonder, were they, were they annihilated? Were there any prisoners taken that were kind of spared afterwards? And also I guess that ties into the part of the song where they said... You know, because I didn't know if he had died in Poltova or if he's going to die in the next song. Apparently he didn't die in this song, but when I, they said the Carolian army never rose again or never, it was their last battle. It's because the army, his army, was decimated, but he survived. So, you know, I thought, I thought, okay, so he survived in Poltova. Okay. So then he's going to die in the next song. Great. Great. Fantastic. A defeat of the Swedish army. Yeah, and actually, we were thinking that it's not going to be that song. Because uh, the song was almost to be about the Battle of Narva instead, okay. uh, where the Swedish won. Yeah. But we didn't want the album Carolus Rex to be a complete, you know, uh, just a promotional uh, album for oh, the Swedish go uh, Empire. Sweden, go Sweden, yeah. Yeah, okay. So we wanted also to show uh, some of the... Uh, defeats and some of the negative uh, reflections of uh, how people saw. I mean, Sweden were sure uh, a great power at this yeah. time, and uh, they did some military achievements that were pretty impressive. It was also one of the songs we made in two languages, Swedish yeah. and English. And I think when I was writing the lyrics for the Swedish one, it was just flowing. It was just poof. It was just there instantly. Uh, but then I got so damn stuck at translating it to English and like to try to write it because my head was so focused on the Swedish. How different was the popularity in the Swedish and the English versions? Very different. Um, and uh, over time as well, the Swedish, we see a huge increase yeah. of people demanding to hear it in Swedish in uh, outside of Sweden. We were in a struggle with the label yeah. because they were obviously like, you can't promote uh, Swedish songs outside of Sweden. The album was mainly promoted outside of Sweden in the English version. And in Sweden, it became hugely popular in Sweden. Why wouldn't the label allow them to, like, um, let the song and let the Swedish album be produced and listened to outside of Sweden? That's kind of like limiting their, their product. Even though, considering, you know, since it's in a different language, it'll probably be like, well, why make all these copies if most likely most of them aren't even going to sell? But still, I mean, I don't know. Even if the ones that don't sell, you can still sell them within Sweden. Eventually, you'll get your money back. But maybe, I, I don't know. I think I just answered my own question. That's probably why they didn't. Because they probably didn't see no monetary value in it. Mm. And nobody cares about the English version. Why would they? <laughs> exactly. But over time, we see, uh, because you can easily follow the streams. You can see how popular songs are. You can see the graphics and, and how are listening to it. And then I can take a song like Poltava and I can compare it over time and see English version versus Swedish. And let's say if I take a country like United States and just focus on United States, song Poltava, Swedish and English and compare them. So in the beginning, streams were way higher on the English version. Yeah. Today, Swedish one in the United States have passed. So we really know is that Feel free to write in the comments and tell us which you would actually want to hear when they, yeah, come, yeah. When they come to see you. And uh, will you actually learn the lyrics of Singlo? Uh, okay, well, Per, thanks a lot for today. Thank you for today. It was a great day. It was a great day. And in one week, it will be another great day because then the next episode comes. The next episode of Sabaton History comes out exactly one week from today. Awesome! That is awesome. We'll see you then. Hey! Listen to me, everybody. We love the Sabaton History Channel. If you do it, please share it with us. Support it on Patreon, YouTube, and any way you want. Thank you for your support. Let's do this forever. Man, I love Andy. He's such a nerd. He's all... <laughs> that had me going. Um, but shoot, man. You know, 
I can't believe he was misled by a guy who said they had who had thirty thousand. Well, he probably did at the moment, but like he said, Peter found out and destroyed one of his capitals. I think they said. I don't know if that was you know along with some troops. Like he only brought fifteen hundred to the table. Man, he got stiffed. He got stiffed hard. But at the same time, he should have stayed. Like I said, I mean, sure he probably didn't need the reinforcements coming because he had a promising separate army. But your troops have been, I mean, they're tired, man, and hungry. They need those supplies. And like I said, can you guys just please tell me, is there a theory out there as to why the battle was halted? That will be interesting to know. Because that makes no sense to me, especially when it was turning in their favor. But that pause was just the time Peter needed to reassess what was going on, realize how big the army really was, and just counterattack and just... Dang, demolish them. And if you guys would do me a huge favor on your way out, just please hit that like button. You don't have to subscribe, but if you hit that like button, it really helps me and my channel grow. You have no idea. I think it does more, um, constructively, it does more for my channel than actually subbing. But, hope you guys enjoyed the reaction. I certainly enjoyed the video. Um, comment down below anything I might have missed, or especially on the theories. I would really love to know why the heck. That's really, I'm perplexed. That's just mind-boggling. But, even if, like I said, even if, he didn't halt. Um, Thirteen thousand against what ninety thousand? They put. They weren't gonna take the battle anyways. They weren't gonna win. And, and also, I let me know about that too. Did Carl the Sec the Twelfth know that Peter had such a large, vast army behind those walls? Or do we know because of hindsight? Uh, let me know what you guys think. Thank you for uh, stopping in this video uh, and watching it with me. I hope to see you guys in the next video, which is, um, actually, I don't know the title of the next song, but I hope to, I hope to, see, I that. <laughs> I hope to see you guys there. Stay safe, stay positive, positive vibes all day, baby, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.